Hello and welcome to episode 54 of the Market Maker podcast and a couple of things to start off with. First of all, hope everyone stays safe and sound. We've got a pretty monstrous storm hitting the UK shores. I think we've already seen, you saw some images this morning, right, Eddie, of, of trampolines and dustbins 100 foot in the air in Cardiff, I think, or somewhere in Wales. Is that right? Yeah, some, uh, some random ob- objects like 300 foot in the air. So keep, keep your head down today. You don't want anything smacking you in the face. Yeah, but honestly, I hope everyone is safe during the, during the next 24 hours or so as it, as it passes through. But otherwise, a massive thank you to not just the internal team at Amplify for the new crypto tech sim that they've put out um, this week they launched. But for everyone who took part, we had an overwhelming response. We had, I think, 650-odd people take it uh, on Wednesday um, afternoon, which was fantastic. So yeah, thanks very much for everyone attend- who attended that. If you haven't done the new one yet, I mean, other than those people, they're the first to go through it. So get involved. All you need to do is just go to amplifyme.com, find the Finance Accelerator and sign up. We've got another one happening on Wednesday next week. So love to see you there. And then thirdly, you probably just heard there, the voice is not Piers Curran, it's Eddie Donmez. And so... Again, Pierce is, um, while we're here fending off, defending the shores from a storm, the biggest in 30 years, Pierce is sunning himself uh, somewhere in, in Southern Europe, I believe. He's always somewhere. It's, it's either the Bahamas, <laughs> you know, Seychelles, Mauritius, or, or in Tuscany. So he needs to get back yeah. and do some work, if you ask me. <laughs> okay, I'll step in and, and, and take the reins. All right, cool. Well, look, as per usual, then a quick summary of some of the, the topical headlines. And then I know there's some, some definite stuff that we can look at uh, with your expertise as well, Eddie. But this week, certainly dominated still by what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Biden, the US president, continued to sound very assertive over the situation, saying that it does remain possible that Russia will invade Ukraine and that they're in a threatening position, despite all of the things that Russia is saying. So we'll delve into that in a moment in a bit more detail. Otherwise, in some of the other major asset classes, gold futures have briefly topped 1900, third weekly gains that we're seeing there. A lot of sparking of safe haven demand, given that, that geopolitical risk increasing. I saw City overnight, they upgraded their near-term gold forecast looking for 1950, citing geopolitical tensions from 1825. Um, something I saw you um, mention on LinkedIn, Eddie, was Elon Musk. He made his second, or he has made the second largest ever charitable donation. What it, what was going on there then? How much has he given away of his wealth? Yeah, I think look, what more my point was on LinkedIn um, was he gets so much stick, he, <laughs> mainly from you and peers, but <laughs> mainly the Democrats, I would say. It's, particularly Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders for just for just being a billionaire you know so I thought I'd give him a bit of uh positive propaganda and point point out that he did actually donate six billion worth of, of Tesla shares uh I think filings were from last year um that's when he, he did it so he yeah he gets so much stick for not paying his taxes and um it, this comes off the back of I don't know if you saw last I think it was last year or very recently um, he was talking about the UN World Food Programme and saying um, about where six billion went. And he said, if I had six billion, I would solve world h- hunger. I would sell my Tesla stock right now. Um, so, you know, don't know if that charity money went there, but at least he's doing something with that money. You know, of course, there's going to be people saying, yeah, it's a tax write off, but it's still yeah. on but a six grow- billion is six billion, right? Exactly. For, for a good for a good cause. So, yeah, I mean, I'm a hater. I hate Elon Musk. So, <laughs> I mean, he is writing off his tax, but that money is going to a good place. So, yeah, I exactly. mean, I, I agree. So all good there. But he's he's landed himself a little bit of hot water overnight. I think it came out where he's tweeted. I think he was tweeting in a thread about crypto and it included then some sort of satirical comparison between the Canadian PM Trudeau and Adolf Hitler. So, and then he's pulled the tweet. I think... The has guy, Elon Musk gone too far? Has he, re- has he realized he's gone too far for the first time in history? But, well, I mean, look, we're here talking about him. So, I mean, here we are. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, other than, other than Elon, 
A um, couple of other things that have been going on. UK inflation. Um, it's not, I don't think it's a big surprise when you see these numbers. I, I know you pick up a normal, you know, if you're just a man in the street picking up the paper and you're like, inflation's 30 year high, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm feeling the pinch. I was looking at the individual basket breakdown. There's some products in your normal, you know, your normal weekly shop, like margarine prices are at like 40% or something. And you're like, okay, that doesn't, that doesn't feel like a lot when you're paying like, I don't know, 20 pence, 30 pence. But when you do a whole shop for a week, and actually there's a meaningful difference where there's a 10 pound difference or something, that's a lot of money for a lot of people. And so the problem here, of course, is the direction of travel, because the number came in at 5.5% in the UK, touch higher than expected. It's a 30 year high, but the Bank of England have already said it's going to go to around seven and a quarter percent in April. We've got a massive leap that's going to happen in energy bills. Taxes are going to go up. So, yeah, this is I guess this is a lot of the, the issue many central banks are facing, which is the threat now to what action follows that you're going to do in response to then what that might do to the implications for the economic performance thereafter. Um, and, and certainly I, I know with the Fed, well, with the Fed 50 basis points, I mean, here we are a week later from that red hot inflation reading, I think we saw 95% priced in for 50. I checked this morning, that's now down to 29% now. Let's just say AC nailed it. <laughs> what did you say? There, there's 30 days to go. Hold your horses. Yeah. I just think that I, every time we, we do this podcast and we kind of go back and we look at the week and it's like, whether it's inflation, whether it's a single stock, whether it's a crypto, the market always overreaches in the first instance, nearly always. Now, I'm not saying 50 basis points. I'm not writing it off because just like it's gone from 95 to 29, it can go up to 95 again. The point I was making was like, don't just make the assumption that 30 days out, it's a, it's a shoe in because 30 days in financial markets is a lifetime. I mean, if Russia goes to war with Ukraine, well then, you know, kiss your 50 basis points goodbye then at that point. Uh, well, absolutely. or not. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I think, yeah, it's, you've been in the market a long time and you can see the, 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 the psychology of markets always overshoots and then pulls back. And it's kind of the same as what you're seeing with, I'm not going to say tech, but high performing tech. So your Shopify's and those companies, of course, they're going to come back. But you see your PayPal's, your Shopify's, they're off 46% year to date over the last year. They've been cut in half, literally 50, 60% down. Do I think that they're going to pull back? And even your Facebooks. Yeah, I know we've given a lot of you know, negative catalysts um, on, on that side and the commentary around that. But are they going to you know, pull out the bag in the next kind of, me let's say, medium term? Of course, I believe they, they will. Sure, there's some low profitability tech, the high growth, more speculative names that some of these are just not going to make it. And they've been punished correctly, in my opinion, down 70, 80, 90%, talking about the kind of disruptive tech names. Just that's really like a venture uh, capital style investment, right? You're trying to pick one winner out of a basket of 100, and that's going to drive your returns. But some of those have been kind of punished correctly. But with your Shopify's and your it's particularly Shopify, the fact that the market's gone so far you know, uh, down is, is speaking to exactly what you were talking about. Well, it sounds like you're, you're, you've are you got a little buy the dip there on your Shopify holding. Well, people have, <laughs> you know, they've been banging the drum about Facebook. Is it time? Is it time? But I think a Shopify that's got such a great um, tech story, but is also then linked to the global economy in terms of, you know, arming the rebels, giving everyone an ability to have a shop front and things like that plays into the secular trend of e-commerce that is not going away, obviously. Yeah. But the fear is, uh, and why the stocks were punished is because the economy is now decelerating uh, in terms of the economic growth that I know we're going to talk about a lot yeah. later on. Well, taking that e-commerce type of element and taking a slightly, taking that on a slight tangent, but JP Morgan this week, they came out with, uh, a report, they're the first bank into the metaverse, opening a lounge in the blockchain-based Decentraland. And I saw, I just saw this like tiger roaming around this really bad looking lounge with a, with a picture of Jamie Dimon on the wall. So 
what what are they saying? I know they did issue a report, and actually, if you want to read the full extensive JP piece on the metaverse, which I highly recommend you do, it's really great analysis. Just jump on Eddie's LinkedIn account, Eddie Donmez, and he's just go to his post. You can access the full report. But Eddie, is there any highlights out of that report that you saw? Yeah, uh, crypto and the metaverse is, of course, uh, gaining traction and is gaining more mainstream attention. And of course, like we joked about, Jamie Dimon was, of course, criticizing Bitcoin and, you know, trashing it. Of course, he's long to the eyeballs, <laughs> crypto and the metaverse. But yeah, that's another story. But yeah, it's really just uh, there was a great report um, published and it's talking about the one trillion dollar metaverse opportunity. And I uh, really liked the, the fact it was really just calling out hype versus reality what's realistic what's not because there's of course a lot of hot air in terms of what it could be um, and then the reality of it is is, is going to be of course very very different as we kind of move uh, five to ten years what that's going to look like but there was some really good uh, stats and analysis I'll let you read it on in the show notes and or link uh, that post but 54 billion is spent on virtual goods uh, every year. Uh, double the amounts uh, spent to, to buy music. So again, with these kind of game gaming M and A and Robloxes that, of course, got punished a little bit after earnings, there is a huge amount of you know demand to spend time virtually playing games, you know, transacting virtual economies and things like that. And what they term it as is metanomics, metanomic models, um, which is basically metaverse economic metanomic. Um, and 60 billion messages are sent daily on Roblox. That's just you know, insane. That's insane. Just insane. I was watching, um, so I went on a, this is what my life is like now every weekend. Yeah. So I was on a play date. Right. <laughs> and then, um, so my daughter's friend has got a slightly older brother and he was he was there on his tablet playing Roblox and he, he was just chatting away. And it, it's just carnage. I don't know if you've actually <laughs> seen them playing it. It's just a whole bunch of these little Lego men going mad, just shouting out, people just talking nonsense but the message the message rate was insane it was just like pop 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 pop. and oh i mean and he was jumping out of these different like i I guess like zones or rooms and it was i know i sound super old now when i say (laughs) completely wrong terminology but yeah it was incredible and just watching him navigate around as well because even my daughter who's like three like watching her just utilize now she could work my 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 pc my laptop my phone and she's she can do all you. three at once she's basically yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah but, i think um, with, with roblox i haven't seen the latest earnings report i have to admit but i remember last earnings report it was really uh, one of their key metrics of course is time spent on platform right how how many hours are people using in terms of gross volume but of course you can get to a per user kind of time spent on platform by dividing it by the number of active users and it was some insane stat it was something like on average each roblox user spends something like three hours a day on the platform Mm -hmm. and it's just in terms of like my brain when i think that i think there's so much opportunity then if someone's spending three hours of their life regardless of how old they are on their interacting socially virtual goods because of course you want to show off if you're a kid you know buying new like armor and swords or things like that and then advertising potential as well if mm. it, imagine there where you like, like you mentioned with the jp morgan metaverse the, the framed picture of jamie diamond imagine mm. you know advertising and stuff like that on the walls there's a there's a huge opportunity obviously there yeah and but the, the interesting thing was you mentioned hype versus reality and I've got a, f- a friend of mine that I knew back at university, and he works at one of the world's largest advertising agencies. And I was talking to him about this whole metaverse thing. And I was getting all excited about it, all caught up in the hype side. And he went, I was like, what, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? And he was like, and just calm down. He was like, people still watch X Factor and, and still want like a primetime advert on like the Super Bowl. Like no one cares about the metaverse in terms of the mass population. That adoption to hit that that you know because i'm the same as you i think just watching this 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 little you know, virtual avatar walking around this land i was like you could just plaster posters on the wall you're basically you can create an unlimited universe basically but then the reality of that is so many hurdles to cross till we get to that point and it's just so interesting he was like 
no one's talking about it because it's just it's we're so far away from that right now and it's options so there's i guess there's different he's at, at the much more i guess transactional part of it whereas jp morgan is trying to position itself with its 12 billion they're spending this year on technology alone i mean i saw the stat that they employ 50,000 technologists at JP, which is more than the entire of Credit Suisse's workforce as a whole organization, which is just insane. But it shows the seriousness in the fintech space beyond just metaverse, where a lot of these big banks are undoubtedly going to have to head towards, right? Yeah, and I think to, to your point, it's purely demographics, right? Like yeah. my mum is not going to be on yeah. Roblox, right? But there's plenty of, you know, Gen Z and, you know, yeah. even after that, entering that, that stage that are going to spend that time. And, you know, like what we're doing at Amplify, right? We build simulations and experiences, you know, in quantitative trading and asset management and sales and trading. You know, eventually we will get to a, a space where we ha will have a, a metaverse, right? And a room where... Um, you know, I'm, I'm sharing all our business plans here, but uh, <laughs> we will have a room where people come virtually to interact and do simulations and augmented and virtual reality, right? Where it's such an immersive experience that basically um, emulates what it is to be on a trading floor or things like that. So it's definitely mm. the way the world's going, but it's definitely a massive demographic divide. I tell you what, fo following that through, it'd be really interesting, given the pivot that we saw when it went through um, floor-based to screen-based trading in the late 90s when we go from uh, web 2 to web 3 based let's say trading it'd be interesting to see whether you get a revert back to type of characteristics that let's say you do a simulate a trading floor in an old style where it's physical but it's physical in an avatar form I, I wonder then like um, how that would play out it'd be interesting to see the full circle uh, effect of that but the other headline just before we get we get more serious on a slightly lighter note. I saw your boy Kanye as coming out and he's boycotting as, as he always does. He's always controversial. Of course, Kanye West is boycotting YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and Amazon with his new album. And he's basically going to have it exclusively only on his own, of course, platform called the STEM player. Have you seen the STEM player? I haven't seen it, but you know who it reminds me of? <laughs> Who else is creating their own social media platform? Uh, it's Mr. Donald. Yeah, Mr. Donald. Exactly. <laughs> They're going to team up. He's going to. He's going to have the. Yeah, he's going to have the, the Twitter replica and then from his from the man Donald, and then he's going to roll out the stem player. I checked out the stem player. Quite tempted to, to make a cheeky purchase. There. Oh really? It's like this little disc, about the size of a CD, but it's about an inch thick. It's kind of like a rubber shape with a with a with a cross on it, and basically, so so when I when I was at university, I used to I used to mix, and we used to have decks, and we used to have the, what we call a Korg pad. So anyone who plays piano or anything like that, so it's an electronic screen that you roll your finger over as a synthesizer to make different sounds. So he's he's created this disc player that's got that you can basically roll your thumb over. And it isolates single channels of the of the music that you're listening to, so okay. you can live mix your own mu his music basically. So it's a it's a it's a Walkman player with a with a screen. Is that what you're saying? Is it? <laughs> it it's, it's got an ability to um, when, uh, it's got ability to add your stamp on someone's music because you right. yourself can in, uh, uh, integrate your own flavor onto it. And, and uh, like, okay. I sound like a salesman. For <laughs> yeah. I'll take five. But yeah, you can basically control vocals, drums, bass, isolate right. parts of the track and stuff like that. So if you're into DJing, it's like a live uh, VJ kind of thing, like visual thing, but you're just doing it with the audio. It's quite cool. 200 bucks. It's a, it's a steal. Anyone who signs <laughs> yeah. up, I'll give you 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but, Drop um... my affiliate link from the bio. <laughs> no, but um, all right. So look, let's... Um, Let's start then with a bit of a, an update of where we're at year to date. You know, we're kind of several weeks in now and we've seen the most volatile January in a long time. Uh, and it still continues to be pretty volatile given the Russian situation as well. So what's that looking like in US equities and on our sector basis as well at the minute? Yeah, I mean, so I'm looking at um, a heat map 
essentially for for the for the viewers uh, or the listeners on on Spotify or Apple Music. Um, so, uh, of course, we're seeing a lot of volatility because of this whole inflation picture, and then the Fed, you know, has come out of really nowhere with a or the markets pricing a potential six to seven hikes uh, for this year. And as you would imagine, as we've just discussed, those really speculative tech names have taken a battering, um, you know, with the with the higher discount rates and things like that, and real a rotation uh, into value, really. And what I'm talking about there is your defences, industrials, energies, and things like that. And that's really painted uh, the picture of um, the heat map of what I'm looking at. So you can see the real stark divergence um, looking at the large cap names now. So Tesla down 17%. Of course, that's its own, you know, roller coaster in itself. But then you've got the contrast of, of energy, which is the, the brightest green on, on my screen right now. So Exxon up 28%, and it had a really good uh, end of the year as well. Chevron up 14%, uh, Conoco Phillips up 26%. And what was, I think, even more surprising, I would say, for me, is that Google down nearly 9% year to date after definitely the best earnings um, report out of all the big cap tech stocks you know if i was to pick one much so like like Piers says google is the most resilient i think um in terms of those big cap tech but and they had the best report but it's down nine percent you know actually apple's only down uh five percent this year so you can see how the market is so sensitive to this current situation which we'll, we'll get onto is higher inflation higher rates and then now this whole Russia Ukraine conflict that I know we'll talk about later um, it's just put the market a little bit on edge and you can see this reflected in the the volatility index the fear gauge essentially um, which is up 24 percent year to date so the VIX and volatility does remain uh, elevated uh, as I assume portfolio managers are buying protection um, you know not you know, let, let's say the Fed then pulls back on those rate hikes and it's maybe three, which is, I, I would say, my base case. Um, tech, big tech, uh, cap tech that is profitable, that does power the market. You know, you, you don't want to rotate completely out of those because that's really the best, you know, uh, I, I for the next, near, in the short term and near term, are going to be the best performers. But you want to buy some protection. You will also want to buy some value stocks. And there was an interesting graphic coming out of the, um, I think it was the Bank of America Fund Manager Survey. The investors have never been as bullish as they are right now on value versus growth. So that really speaks to where we are in the market in terms of really favoring those kind of defensive names. Uh, what was interesting to me from a sector rotation, sector performance perspective is any, uh, sorry, healthcare, which is generally seen as more of a defensive name, uh, is down, I think, 9% year to date. So really, um, it's kind of March 2020 vibes where there was nowhere to hide with yield spiking and you know we all remember those nightmare days but um, yeah even some of the defensives um, you know not 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 performing too well and then when you've got the fear of this kind of recession um, you know really being elevated at the moment in the second half of the year that then really takes the the steam out of the, those cyclical names that of course a be benefit when growth and economic growth is is high or accelerating. It's funny, just listening to you talking about the healthcare being down, even though the defensive, then talking about really high inflation, both of those you in the conversations, what, two years ago, you'd be going, oh, so how high is Bitcoin? How, how well is crypto doing right now? Because before it was always, that's the flight to quality, that's the inflation hedge. And here we are, Bitcoin still sat at that 40k for the so moment. Yeah, so for, for, for me, Bitcoin has never been an inflation hedge, right? It's mm. a risk on asset period. When liquidity is flowing, financial conditions are loose, money will flow there, right? Yeah. It's, it's a hedge against uh, basically money printing, essentially. So when the, when the Fed and you know, there's more debt, there's money being printed, it's a hedge against that monetary, basically currency debasement, in my opinion. But right now, it's very clear that we're in a risk off phase, right? Uh, there's fear in the market, there's volatility. And of course, you're going to pivot out of, you know, those high beta names, Bitcoin, your, your high, uh, let's say, uh, disruptive names like ARK. So it's never been, in my opinion, an inflation hedge. 
How, how is uh, Kathy? What's, when was the last time you spoke to her? Oh, well, we had a Zoom call uh, in January. It wasn't looking too good for her, but no, no. I think she was on CNBC yesterday, and she just had another clanger, basically. So she was on CNBC getting interviewed, and obviously, Arc holds Zoom as a as a stock, right? And something that popped up on her screen was your time is running running out which means that uh, she's not, she was on she the free version <laughs> so it was just that like actually happened it actually happened the, the <laughs> come came up um and it said look you're running out of time and so it shows that well of course on the computer she was on whatever that is she yeah. wasn't actually paying for, for zoom which was just another one in that kind of just, she's having a, a, a terrible time let's just put it put it that way but i mean it, if you're investing in her etf i mean surely that is a long-term speculative proportional minority makeup of any of your holdings because of the nature of what it is in an innovation it, fund well it should be yeah. basically in your I mean, whole so what so, so why why i don't get why people are so like upset or so like frantic about it it's like well that's just the nature of what you're investing in and so it yeah. went up a huge amount initially and now it's come down a lot so <laughs> yeah such so is think, that type of type of investment i think in terms of where retail were positioned of course over the last five years she's had amazing performance mm. so let's give her massive credit in terms of her inception the arc funds have done incredibly well um, so that's where retail have been making a lot of money when financial conditions are loose. The, uh, after the COVID crash, the, fist, the stimmy checks, low monetary policy, low interest rates, um, you know, times were good. So everyone's been positioned in, in those kind of funds, Bitcoin, I bucket into that, the high beta names making a ton of money. And of course, if you're, you generally, if you're investing in those, you've never seen them go down or you've seen them go down very little. So in this mm. kind of new new regime, if you like, of higher inflation and potential higher interest rates, then of course there's going to be volatility. Yeah. Just two other stock stories that I saw. Amazon have reached a worldwide deal with Visa, uh, accepting payments on their credit cards through its stores. And that was going on for months and months. And then the other one was about Walmart earnings. I saw exceeded expectations. Uh, any thoughts on that, just given what you're saying about the sector movements that we're seeing at the moment, given yeah, the nature not, of their business? Yeah, not too much. I think Visa, um, in terms of, you know, they got they got pulled by Amazon. Isn't that right? They yeah, got they have, pulled yeah. on the, in the UK, it was as a kind of trial. And everyone was calling for the worst, saying they're going to pull Visa mm. kind of payment processing all over the world. And that would obviously be a massive hit to to someone like like Visa. But they're, they're, they're up for 4%. Um, year to date so they're slightly more resilient as transactions are, are going on but then again if you're looking forward into the second half of the year recession risk kind of um, increasing in likelihood and a not so soft landing from the fed then you're going to think mm, actually um, you know you're not too not too keen on that um, in terms of walmart as well it's those consumer staples that uh, of course as uh, prices go up in terms of the supermarkets people are not, not going to not get margarine or they're not gonna um, not buy any fruit and avocados and things like that they're gonna keep purchasing them so those defensive names uh, definitely uh, outperforming those kind of more more uh, high beta names okay cool well look, let's let's delve into the the russia ukraine side of things and i i guess i can kick it off with we were recording this on on friday the 18th. So depending on when you listen to this, I'm sure the situation may have evolved. But as it stands at the end of this week, uh, the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov is going to meet with US Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Europe next week. So the week coming, Russia told the US in its official response to security proposals from Washington, that it has no plans to attack. Uh, they've, they've kind of stuck to that all week. Um, regardless, Biden is going to speak to transatlantic leaders today about the Russian troop buildup. The Russian defense minister is going to be speaking with the US counterpart as well today. So one thing this does mean is there's going to be a heck of a lot of headlines flying around. And I think that's definitely one thing if you are not used to watching short-term markets, so intraday, you could easily get caught the wrong side of this. So a couple of kind of 
ground rules for anyone who does look at short-term markets is always think about the source of where that information is coming from. Because having seen this initial conflict in 2014 and other conflicts over the years, definitely dependent on the origination of that piece of news, the same event can be reported completely differently. So in this case, you know, IFX or Russian news agency, or if it's a Ukrainian or if it's American or Western European, you've just got to be conscious of the fact of not over committing and jumping on one piece of information without then seeing it um, line up with other, other credible sources. So trying to trade the intraday noise in a situation like this, I'd say, unless you have access to the fastest news aggregation software or individuals who will service that job for you, which is only really for professional investors, as a retail trader trying to trade some of these headlines, I think, forget it. Because <laughs> you're going to get smoked in the wrong direction. Um, taking a positional play, thinking, you know, this is going to get worse. My belief is because of X, Y, Z. Therefore, like you said, I want to pick up some uh, exposed kind of hedging of that risk by the VIX or via some other play. Sure, that makes some sense. But trying to trade outright to catch these moves, forget it. Um, the other thing is people, all, people often have this, this, uh, this preconceived conception that, um, or perception that news just comes from Bloomberg. Uh, and I can see why that is because all you know, institutions will have Bloomberg terminals. But I can tell you now, when it comes to this type of information, Bloomberg are horrendous. They are so far behind the curve, it's unreal. That's because they report financial news. They do not report on the scene in some small village in Ukraine because that's not what they do. And so what I would do and would have done in the past is I would find that journalist who works for the BBC or for a, a UK newspaper or a Ukrainian newspaper, and I'd follow them on Twitter, for example, because they're on the scene firing this stuff out in real time of which Bloomberg typically would be minutes later. And so although you need eyeballs to move the market, if you can get a time arbitrage, that's when then you can trade these headlines. But if you're not doing that, forget it. So in terms of, so that's obviously on the short term basis in terms of a like actual scenario happening and the incentives behind it, how much did you value in your time listening to like RT Russia news or, you know, basically foreign mm. news agency, because if, if you listen to Al Jazeera, you get yeah. a different story. If you are listening to RT news, you're getting a different story. If you listen in CNBC, you're obviously getting the, the American view. How much in your career did you value in terms of the actual from the Russian side? What is the incentive system? What are they actually going to do? What do they really want? How much did you value that? Yeah, I, I think a great deal. Um, I know it sounds like it would be exhausting to follow all those kind of channels uh, of information, but a big part of, I think, what my skill has become is to be able to determine the strategy and how then governments like Korea or China or Russia use propaganda to flex on their optics to service what it is as their end objective. And so in order for me to determine how serious or not I believe, say, Russia is, I have to see what Russian media is reporting because that's coming from the state. And so that gives me a degree of how they're lining up and whether or not they're going to make um, a strategic move in this, in this instance. Then I kind of play that off and I think about, well, why is Biden being like he is? I mean, all week Biden has been banging the drum. I mean, the last shot I saw yesterday was a classic Trump, Trump shot. He's taken one out of the playbook. This is when they have the chopper in the background and the chopper's going really loud. Yeah. And they go, President, President, what do you think about Ukraine, Russia? <laughs> and he goes, I think that, and it's like, his hair's blowing, the chopper's going. It's a classic. Like he's being That's, flown in from right. one line. But that is curated. Like, that's not like an impromptu shot. That is done on purpose. And even though that has nothing to do with him having military expertise or anything like that, this is all part of how this works. And, and so, look, to give you an idea, the reports 
that we've had this morning is that Russia is they're going to they're going to conduct strategic drills on Saturday. Putin, according to Russian press, so again this is optics. He's going to oversee it personally. I mean, in your head now, visually, you've just got this picture of him sat there, you know, with his shirt off, <laughs> overseeing these military drills in in the snow on a bear. <laughs> but the point is, is that if you think about um, what has been happening, and I've got a few points that, to cover on this about my overall thoughts and what might happen here. But you know, think about North Korea, it's the same. We see intensification of these uh, provocative kind of steps, firing ballistic missiles, these tests at the weekend. You know, The Western press in Europe, in the UK and the US, they really latch on to the idea that it's going to be um, ballistic missiles, that they really hype it up because that helps their own domestic agenda to then garner support for them being more forceful in the actions that they take. And it ticks the box for Biden on his ability to reinsert control on the foreign affairs where he's totally blew, blew it with and Afghanistan. Distract. And distract <laughs> right. away from inflation. And that's a massive thing, right? So you're absolutely right. For me, the biggest um, pivot he needs to make as far as the electorate is concerned is they are going to feel some serious pain. Now, I think people are people in markets are fairly focused on the fact that US growth, US jobs, they've all surprised to the upside. Um, and it's been like, oh, okay, so that means that the economy underlying all of this is strong, Omicron's over, it can survive these rate hikes that are pending. But actually, I, I delivered a session um, at UCL University in London this week, and I was talking to their lead professor, um, of that program. And he was talking about the February preliminary University of Michigan sentiment report. So that's basically a report where they telephone um, thousands of different consumers and they ask them about how do they feel about economic conditions at the moment and the future. And the impact of higher inflation on personal finances was spontaneously cited by one third of all consumers with nearly a half of all consumers in the US expecting declines in their inflation-adjusted incomes during the year ahead, which will become a reality. We're seeing that in the UK. Saving rates are getting slammed at the moment. So as you were kind of alluding to and you're talking about is this, and we can get to this in a second, is this threat of then the risk of recession increasing over the course of action the Fed might take with hikes. The consumer at the moment, if they lose that confidence to spend, or is this what the, then the Fed actually wants to engineer to cool demand to control inflation? Well, we can discuss that in a moment. But these are all these are all reasons. I think you're absolutely right why Biden has to make a big deal of Russia because at home there's some really bad things happening on, with inflation, and so it's Russia now. If you think about four six weeks ago, do you remember it was Saudi Arabia? They were having pop shots left, right, and center saying oil prices are moving higher. It's Saudi Middle Eastern fault. And there's no word on Saudi now. And oil prices are higher than where they were because now the Russia's the bigger ticket in town to talk about in that, in that sense. So the final kind of word I'd say on, um, on this situation is not so much about the economic side. It's more about the geopolitical side. I saw a really great report from a professor at University of Melbourne um, in Australia, and she outlined three points of why she said that all out war, Russia, Ukraine won't happen. So I've, I'm just going to extract out some of the, the, those three major points. Number one, the massing of troops, both as defensive maneuver that fortifies Russia's southwest border, and as a signal to the West of its seriousness with Russia, used the position of Western forces on its doorstep. So an invasion of Ukraine would force Western countries to increase their own military preparedness for war with Russia, if not mobilized to act to defend Ukraine. And that's tantamount to further reduction of Moscow security. So it's counterintuitive for them to actually do this or go too many steps too far beyond trying to posture and leverage in negotiation because it's going to mean there's even a greater threat of military presence against them. Number two was Russia's geopolitical strategy. You know, you go back through history since the fall of the Soviet Union, they've always um, 
well, in terms of the military movement, that they haven't tended to involve, involve overt aggression. Rhetoric, yes. Actually, military personnel movement, no. So the, there's a pattern recognition here of the type of behavior that we're seeing. And this gets seen in other um, areas of conflict, like with Korea and China and so on. Sounds aggressive. It very rarely tantamounts to something of military action. So that's another thing. Um, Russian foreign interventions have been um, based on pragmatic consideration of proportionate force, which is necessary to meet its interests. That's very important because it gets, um, I guess, pigeonholed by Western media is in the, you know, they're very out of control. It's on a knife edge. It could happen any moment. It, it doesn't, this is, we're talking of war here. It's, these things don't happen too much like that these days. <laughs> However, we will talk about, there's obvious risks to that, that scenario. And then thirdly, if the seizure of Ukrainian territory was of significant Russia interest, think about it. That opportunity was in 2014. That's not now, because now it's harder. <laughs> and now there's more repercussion because there's more involvement globally in this matter. If they were going to do it, they would have done it. And now's not the time. And so with all of this, of course, there's been other reports about, okay, sanctions. Putin can survive those sanctions because he's making more money than ever because the price of oil at the moment. So great. The summary I would say of this um, is Russia uses its presence similar to that of, say, in Iran uses its nuclear program, if you think about it, as a means of extraction of concessions from the Western world. I see it exactly like that in this instance. So it threatens, but it will never fully act because to do so would mean an exchange of leverage for punishment. And they don't want to do that. It's self-inflicting. And so this is just a very serious game of poker that's going on is what I'm saying. But welcome to the world of geopolitics. This is what it's all about. Um, so I think, I think in summary, Biden's full of, BS when it comes to this. I think he's got, I think he's absolutely got an agenda. As we've just discussed, I think he wants to manage his foreign policy and how people view him on that front after Afghanistan and others situations. And I think inflation is his biggest headache. And I just think, I think the, the winner here is, is Vladimir Putin. Right. Now. I, I agree with all of that. I, I, I think if you listen to the Western media, Putin is a thug, you know, he's a madman. He's not. He's a very intelligent, calculated leader, much in the same vein as Xi Jinping. They're thinking in like, they're playing 3D chess while the rest of the world are, you know, responding to this. He's thinking three years out, five years out. I don't think it's in his interest. I don't think he really wants war. It's very much posturing. We do need to think about, and for the just for the listeners, in terms of when you posture so much, especially like we've seen with in 2017 with uh, North Korea and things like that, there's always an increased chance, and this is what I worry about, of an accident hmm. or a a mis misinterpretation. Yeah. or a misinterpretation or a, you know a loose cannon much like there it was with the capital riots it only takes of course you're going to attract out of a million people one or two that take these extreme views too far so when you think about ukraine you've much like the other kind of eastern european states like uh, romania and moldova is you have russian ukrainians and you have more european ukrainians those that you know don't want kind of russian interference and what you have to at least um, calculate or take seriously as a risk is one of these people already in Ukraine, even if there's not an invasion, taking things too far or take, you know, firing a shot or mm. taking some pro provocative action that then accidentally triggers military action from both sides. So I think, yes, I, my base case is this doesn't happen. It's not in anyone's interest, in my opinion. And if I was Vladimir Putin, I'd be doing exactly the same thing. Do I want NATO in my in my backyard, getting closer and closer to my territory? Would I always like to say, 
would America allow Russia to take Canada, right? Or to have an <laughs> uh, increased military presence in Canada or Cuba? Of course they wouldn't, right? They would be, you know, in the exact same defensive position. So yes, my base case is this doesn't spill over, but accidents can happen. Um, but I think what Ant talked about in terms of even myself, you know, listening to all these headlines fire out, you know, they're invading, they're not invading. The one thing that made me laugh was like, yes, an invasion is expected on February the 16th. <laughs> in what world would a military invasion be, be well known, right? The whole point <laughs> is it's meant to be a surprise or it's meant to be a, you know, a big, a big move to catch the opposition, you know, off guard. It wouldn't be broadcasted to the whole world so they know exactly when they're, they're invading. Don't, uh, James Bond is not actually, didn't actually die. <laughs> Yeah, he's in Russia right now. Yeah. He got the date out, but yeah, I mean that that type of thing. I mean the, the amount of comments that have come out of the the US where they've made claims and then had no supporting evidence to back up then these claims, which is what makes it so transparent to me of what they're 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 trying to do. But look, I mean, I won't say any more on, on that matter. But um, I know just to finish, Eddie, you wanted to, to touch upon. Just generally, I guess, what we've t- talked about with equities, the risks, the 50 basis points, um, lots of yield movement that we've been talking about in recent podcasts. But this idea then about Fed strategy and managing 2022, I guess. So what are your thoughts on um, the yield curve inversion and risks of recession, good, bad, and how can they engineer controlling inflation through a, a rate hiking kind of sequence they're in a real tough spot to put it lightly they've got one big problem at the moment uh, and that's inflation and traditionally there's kind of two ways that they can kind of slow inflation by hiking short-term rates or by forcing long-term interest rates higher and historically the fed really have used rate hikes to engineer recessions right? But actually soft recessions in the sense of just to take some kind of heat off the economy. Um, it's, it's, it's termed opportunistic disinflation, right? So it's to keep generate that slack in the economy to keep inflation in check whilst basically managing their, their dual mandate, essentially. But the point is, every Fed tight, tightening cycle has ended in a crisis. And the probability now of a Fed mistake or a policy error, I believe, is is highly elevated. Um, just in terms of where the market's priced, you, even you see this now in uh, mortgage rates, for example, the market's moving, and the Fed hasn't even moved yet. So I believe they're they're highly behind the curve. They should have gone. Um, I, I sent you a, a text. I don't know if you remember in the last policy meeting with uh, some expletive language about Powell <laughs> <laughs> saying he should have gone, basically. Um, in, in kind of Q4, now they're behind the curve. The market's moving, right? And pricing in six, seven hikes, getting ahead of itself. Mortgage rates are, are kind of, um, they're through 4% now if you're looking at the 30-year mortgage rate in, in the US. You've got high inflation now coming again from if this Russia situation does uh, you know, evolve. You've then got more oil price uh, inflation. You've got, um, and just remember all those Eastern European countries, they pr- produce a lot of fertilizer as well. So it, with everything else, you've still got supply chain issues that are slowing in terms of their severity and they are improving. I saw a really interesting chart uh, showing that but they're still very very ele- elevated if you throw higher fertilizer costs into that um palladium and all the kind of um inputs that, or exports from russia inputs for uh, all of the western worlds you've got then higher food prices into economies and households that have let's let's be clear have been in very strong state after the stimmy checks, um, the work from home, people still getting paid and things like that. However, the purse strings are tightening, oil prices, the price to fill up your car are increasing, the food in price prices are increasing, you've got um, a lack of supply in terms of labor. So this is where the, the wage 
pressure is coming from, which again is not a great sign for the Federal Reserve. So they've got a lot of things that are going against them right now. And they don't know what to do. I believe that they don't know what to do at Mar in March. Do they go 50? Do they go 25? Do they go 50 and wait? I don't think they actually know what they're going to do in March. And that's probably where the market pricing that was 100% priced um, for, Mar for March 50 is now gone down to a 30, 40% probability because the market's now going, actually, I, we don't know what the Fed are going to do. They don't because they don't know what they're going to do, um, but they're not in a you know, uh, a positive scenario. One interesting thing I did see from Pozar, who is a Credit Suisse strategist, very well known, has the ear of the Fed, is basically that the Fed may actually want to move down the Powell put and allow a bit of volatility. And he actually termed it as uh, the, the Volcker, but Vol standing for volatility and letting equities and Bitcoin and all this speculative excess come out of the market because it may actually then force some more people into the labor um, labor force to actually ease those wage inflation um, that we've seen. So has the Powell put moved down a little bit, maybe to 3,800 or you know, uh, a little bit lower? You know, we'll, we'll see, but they're not in a in a great situation at the moment. Um, that, that's my my take on it. Yeah, and then what was it? Goldman Sachs a few days back, they're starting to get a little bit more cautious in their their outlook. Yeah, alongside some other U.S. banks and their MS is always. Yeah, so they, they, on that side. they cut their, their S&P target from 5,100 to 4,900 based on lower valuations and, uh, and higher inflation. They've actually, again, projected out a, a recession downside case all the way at 3,600. Um, and of course, the big problem comes when you have a central bank tightening into a slowing economy. Pair this with high inflation lower consumer confidence. Consumer confidence is at an 11-year low right now. This could materially hit earnings. And this is when companies will suffer from lower demand from the economy slowing, plus an inability to raise prices from that lower consumer confidence. So um, that's the kind of picture at the moment. So valuations coming down. The real risk at the moment is S&P 500 earnings and EPS growth is, is still strong. It's remained strong, but it's decelerating. So if you get the E, for example, in those PE ratios also coming down, then you've got a real problem because then you've got companies not generating earnings. Valuations, if, if you hold the, the, if you pull the E down, the ratio gets more expensive, even if the price doesn't move, right? So then you need prices to come down to fit that kind of multiple of a 15 or a 20 times earnings. So the thing to watch going forward really is, of course, the Federal Reserve, but it's then the resilience of earnings. And if that falls out of bed, then look out below. Yeah, I, I kind of like the idea at the moment of it, there's, there's so much yet to be answered over the coming weeks going into that March meeting, I, I, I kind of like the feeling of keeping my powder dry and actually seeing how this plays out. And if that worst case scenario materializes and you do get that 3,600 type move, being in a position then to then, uh, the, I'd, I'd say you're going to get a forceful reversal if we then go down that low and, and then the market will readjust for the second half of the year. It's almost like this this big dramatic shift we've had to have to go to ultra hawkish mode has been painful. And I'd rather let that pain shake out first. I think if I was thinking about it more strategically as a, as a year long view uh, to invest, but cool. Well, look, we'll wrap it up there. And thanks Eddie for, for taking the time out to jump on. Always a pleasure. Never a chore. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Um, as I said, I'll drop in the show notes, the, link to the metaverse report for jp i'll also drop the link for our market maker daily newsletter and also the crypto tech new simulation if you haven't done it get involved it's free to do of course as per always our, our mission to get it out there to as many people as possible so if you're interested in sales trading market making asset management then, then check it out in the show notes all right take care everyone see you next week